how in the world can you tell the difference between a llama and an alpaca? <laughs> it's great. Llamas no, it's just that anything possible, you know, we really try to focus on a lot of things with paws. And what's great is with, we, we're having this beautiful opportunity to talk about uh, livestock and just now animals with toes instead. And so this is a sort of an inaugural episode for anything possible where we delve into these issues. So help us out. Although that may be a remedial question, there are a lot of people wondering, how do you tell the difference between a llama and an alpaca? Yeah, per perhaps even funnier, you made me think back to my childhood because going, when, when the heck did I even first see a llama or an alpaca? And, and I have to say, right. I think my first visual seeing of a llama would have been in the original Dr. Doolittle movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. I think it's Rex Harrison. No. Yep, called the Push Me Pull You. And it was kind of this, this llama-like creature that had heads on both ends and they called it the Push Me Pull You. But anyway, <laughs> llamas and alpacas. Llamas are larger. Uh, so pound-wise, they'll be on anywhere from about 250 pounds on up. Really, really large llama is going to approach up to 400 pounds. But usually they're in that 300, 350 pound range. They also, if you look at their ears, their ears have a little bit different conformation. People talk about them being banana ears. They're, they kind of have a curve. Okay, banana ears. Their fiber coat is more coarse. It, it is not the, the individual hairs have a greater diameter to them. So in general, they're a little bit more coarse than our alpacas. To me, their, their face has a little bit, and I think other people that raise them, their face has a little bit different conformation. Alpacas have a, to me, a more refined, a little bit deer-like, but a, a, a more dainty, refined face to them than do llamas. Llamas are a little bit bulkier right. head and face and nose than our alpacas. So alpacas are smaller, uh, run for an adult alpaca, oh, anywhere from about 125 on up to maybe as big as 325 pounds. Okay. Their, their fiber is much thinner and much finer than llamas. And that's one of the things that makes them a little bit more valuable from the, the textile or the fiber standpoint. And, uh, and they do make some really, really remarkable, both llamas and alpacas, but especially alpacas, make some really remarkable textile um, type things from, from their fiber. Right, right. So llamas are larger, coarser hair, have daintier faces and, and banana shaped ears. But it, you, you mentioned that a, a lot of them do make this incredible fur. But there was a, a, a llama boom, a, a boom in llama farming, or at least yeah. what I remember just as I was coming up uh, in child. Now, listen, when I was younger, I was not interested in, in llama farming. I don't know if I paid attention to the news back then. But in retrospect, I remember hearing something about it in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, was there a big boom? What in the world were people doing with all of these llamas? Why in the world was there such a tremendous interest in llama farming uh, way back in the, 90, the 80s and the 90s? And why has it declined? Yeah, so that's a little bit harder for me to answer as a veterinarian and not a person yes. who owned the llamas and alpacas because right, right. I, I, I hope I don't disturb any of our previous clients, but I also wondered that same thing, at, even at the time, you know, why right. are these animals so valuable? The first reason they were valuable early on is, is that they were rare. So coming on into the United States, they were rare. Another thing that happened with llamas and alpacas at that time is they developed the registries and then they had quite a significant, um, uh, I guess, show type scenario where llamas would go and compete against each other relative to their show type and how well they met this conformational expectation of a llama or an alpaca. And so, you know, you had your top beautiful llamas and alpacas and they they'd right. garner a higher value from a breeding standpoint. And so there were breeding fees and, and all that sort of stuff stuff and that that brought this boom on up as people were trying to say oh i want to get into this i want right. to breed llamas or alpacas and then sell these to other people and then breed on more and more and more and and um, keep developing this um, this livestock industry this alpaca and llama industry in the u.s so that was the upslope the upslope was going pretty good until the 2008-2009 recession. Ah. 
And when that hit and the, the extra money came out of the floor of our economy, then people said, wait a minute, these llamas and alpacas, they aren't really necessary. <laughs> what are we, right. why are we having them? <laughs> and, uh, and so the, the bottom really dropped out of that market. They went, their value dropped by almost tenfold. Uh, wow. And so that was quite remarkable. Made a difference from our standpoint from veterinary medicine, because at one point, you know, we were treating them as highly valued animals, you know, almost like a breeding stud if it was a, a stallion or a bull or something. Right. And, and now they don't have that value. So they, they fall back into just general livestock um, scenarios as far as value. And that, that makes a difference as far as, as far as veterinary care and what, what they can afford yes. and how much we can treat for them. And I think we're really, we are at a good place right now because now they're seen as basically a stable livestock commodity. And, and their purposes range everything from, from the textile industry as well as then pack animals, um, which is a wonderful use. And also for llamas guard animals. They actually function as really good guard animals for sheep and goats. And they will protect a herd uh, or a flock of sheep and goats just like guard dogs can and can be very, very oh, um, good at protecting against predators. So it can be a little bit feisty. You know, yes. that, feist, that feistiness it reminds me a little bit of, uh, I was speaking with a doctor friend of mine who has a daughter and she became, her daughter became, is 10 years old, became extremely interested in chameleons. And she really wanted a <laughs> chameleon. So she basically said to her, okay, what I want from you before we get a chameleon is, I want you to give me a PowerPoint presentation on what's required for a chameleon, what their behavior is like, what are some good medical practices to keep them alive, happy and healthy. And after her daughter did that presentation, she came back to her mom after hours of research and said, I don't think our house would be very good for a chameleon, you know, because she had learned about the good husbandry practices uh, required for reptiles. My question to you is when, when starting out and, and thinking about having a llama, I'm imagining that some people weren't really attuned to or weren't really knowledgeable about some of their behavior characteristics and their personality characteristics. Do you have any interesting pearls of wisdom in regards to just behavior and, and personalities when it comes to llamas and alpacas? My understanding is that camelids in general are a little bit head shy. Yeah, yeah. so they are head shy and, that's, and, that's, and they're also leg shy. They don't like you touching their legs. They don't and like that you actually goes back, that goes back to their behavior and the way they socialize with each other. So llamas and alpacas are herd animals. And within that herd, they develop a very, very organized hierarchy of, of dominance and submissiveness within that herd. And they do that predominantly by fighting. And when they fight with each other, they go and bite at each other and they either bite up around the head, neck and face or down around the legs is where they fight. Got it. So from, from me as a human, even though I'm not so much in their social structure, if I go right. on into an animal and I reach up and grab for the face or try and hold the face or I grab for a leg to pick up and look at the foot, they interpret that as me fighting with them, or at least that's our interpretation of it or what we think right. is happening. And they respond with generally a, um, an avoidance response. They try and move away from that. They'll, if I grab at a leg, they'll try and kick or stomp at the leg or move away. If I grab at their head and face, they'll go, no, I don't want that. And they'll try and move away. So right. that's, that's one of the first things. Person needs to, needs to start to understand their behavior and how to work with their behavior and um, make them so they're manageable. That's, that's it's, listen, all of this sort of ethology or study of animal behavior, particularly llama and alpaca beha behavior, is just not something that a lot of people get, a lot of veterinarians get. So every, we're hanging on every word you say. I really appreciate you breaking it down, breaking it down for us. But we've got to talk about one thing that every camelid's kind of known for, and that is spitting. Can you break that down for us? Like, what, like why in the world? Uh, are they, do they spit? And that's kind of like the one thing that nobody wants yeah. is to be spit on by either a camel, a llama, or an alpaca. Why do they do it? And is it truly spit or is it gastric fluids? Yeah, great, great question. So um, 
it is it is gastric gastric fluid that they regurgitate on up from their stomach. So, right. you know, we have ruminants over here, yeah. on the land, so cattle, sheep, uh, goats, and then we have llamas. Llamas are actually what are called pseudo ruminants. So they don't have they they function similarly to a ruminant, but instead of having a rumen and a reticulum and an omasum and an abomasum, big gastric stomach that's divided into three compartments. So it's just called interesting. It, uh, compartment one, compartment two, compartment three. Really original names there. There's no other names to it. Yep, it's just gastric compartment one, gastric compartment two, and gastric compartment three. Fair. Gastric compartment three is similar to our stomach. It's where this acid gets secreted, digestion starts um, from our, our normal monogastric standpoint, it starts there. The gastric compartments one and two are kind of like the rumen and the reticulum in a cow. And that's where fermentation happens, where bacteria and protozoa and yeast break down the fiber material of the, of the forage that they're eating and, uh, and make that into digestible um, and absorbable feedstuffs or nutrients. So being a pseudo-ruminant, they will, and you'll see if you watch a llama do this, you'll see them as you're standing there, periodically they will regurgitate up a cud of feed material that's down in their gastric compartment. And right. then they'll take that and they'll rechew it. And they're basically yeah. going to do that. They're breaking down the grass components, the, the fiber components into smaller and smaller pieces, and then they'll swallow that back down. Okay, so when they spit, that is what they are spitting at you. So you're exactly right. It is their gastric contents, and it smells like their gastric contents. It tastes like their gastric contents. I can attest to that. And um, <laughs> uh, now why they learn that that is a way for their social interaction that helps defer other animals away from them if they're getting in a fight. But when they fight with each other, they will stand and face off and they will scream and holler and try and bite each other and then also spit at each other with those gastric contents. Yeah, you said you can attest to the fact that they taste like gastric contents. My heart goes out to you. That means at some point in your long, illustrious career, sounds like you've been spit on before. Yes, yes, indeed. But unlike a spitting cobra, they will not make you go blind. <laughs> well, listen, if that's the one redeeming quality of being spit on is that you will not go blind, we'll take it. Now, listen, you jumped right into some of the medical aspects, which I love talking about, like I said, I'm, I'm certainly geeking out talking to you because of just your knowledge base. You know, they talk about, the, uh, for humans at least, the, the eyes being the windows to the soul and what's going on, uh, what's going on in your body with ruminants or foregut fermenters, like what you just mentioned, the four compartments, rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. Uh, the rumen, they say you can really detect what's, what's the health of, of an animal listening to the rumen. Uh, how important is it when you're really treating uh, a camelid is understanding gut sounds? And is that something you do as a clinician is actually listen to gut sounds of whether you're treating camels, llamas, or alpacas? Yeah. So no, that, that is absolutely true. So, you know, here in the hospital, whether it be our physical exam or just our daily monitoring of patients, you know, we all collect vital signs. So the standard temperature, pulse, respiration rate, check mucous membranes, all, all of that sort of stuff. But in a ruminant and pseudo-ruminant species, the gastric contractions, so the rumen contractions or this first compartment contractions, is just another one of our vital signs that we measure each time that we do a physical exam on these patients. And the reason it is is because as these animals get sick, then when they when they get sick, you tend to get a decrease in that gastric activity. And, um, and that's recognized by either the strength of those contractions and the loudness of what we hear or the frequency of those contractions. And when animals are really sick, those contractions will stop altogether. And that usually right. tells us that we've got some sort of definitely a, a, a underlying disease condition that needs to be investigated further. Well, that's really important that you bring up because, I mean, uh, in, the, in the small animal world, of course, we recognize ileus. Of course, we recognize a decrease in, in gastric motility. You know, I was just up at 4 a.m. doing a GDV surgery in a dog this morning. So we, we get that. However, 
that, that notion of really a sculpting for gastric uh, sounds and gastric motility in the small animal world, I think it's really important to, remember, to, to note that that's not something that's done very commonly. I've certainly done it, uh, but I can admit obviously to you that I don't do that on every patient. And it's not a typical or classic part of every physical exam done in a small animal world. So I'm so happy that you brought that up. Well, I think, I think the difference comes in the anatomy as well. Uh, you know, right. in, in a monogastric, you have this relatively smaller gastric compartment there that has motility, but its motility is, 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 is more of a, a progressive motility to, to, to just simply contract and move gastric contents into the duodenum. Sure. Whereas our motility in the, in the stomach or the, the rumen or the, uh, the first gastric compartment is actually a very, very strong, robust contraction that actually mixes the feed material to allow that fermentation and digestion to occur. So it is a much, much, much more robust contraction than it is with our, our normal monogastric stomach. 